Let's see. Uh, up next, we have Sun Young Park. Is that the order? Correct. Okay. <laughs> uh, who is an assistant professor of history in the Department of History and Art History at George Mason University? She received her PhD in the history of architecture and urbanism from Harvard. And uh, it has a forthcoming manuscript, Ideals of the Body, Architecture, Urbanism, and Hygiene in Post-Revolutionary Paris, coming, for, um, coming out with the University of Pittsburgh Press. And just this year has won uh, a couple of really great awards, a National Endowment for the Humanities Summer Stipend, and a Mellon Author Award from the Society of Architectural Historians. Please welcome Sun Young Park. background of where I teach. I teach at a large public state university in Northern Virginia. Um, it's close to DC. It's also a very immigrant rich area. So we tend to have a very diverse student body. Um, and they also, I would say, tend to be fairly liberal, although not universally. Um, and our campus has a very active and visible LGBTQ student group. So I would say that teaching gender sexuality issues is not as tense or fraught as in some of the other universities that are um, represented in our panel. Um, but our students tend to have fairly traditional views about what they expect to learn in a history class. Um, so for example, when I first started at George Mason, you know, I was offering suggestions for courses like gender, sex, and the city, or modernity and body politics. And I was gently told that our students really tend to gravitate towards classes with titles like the French Revolution, <laughs> defined time and place, you know, or the Cold War. So one of the classes that I do teach most regularly is 19th century Europe. Um, but even through these courses, I found ways to introduce historical literature and topics that students have not encountered previously in history class and typically did not expect to encounter in a survey course of um, European history. Uh, so the particular example I wanted to present today is one that I use when I teach about class and gender identity in the 19th century. Um, and I use material that I know, uh, that I'm most familiar with from my research in the post-revolutionary period. Um, and this class will usually happen around the first, you know, month of the semester. But after a time when we've already, you know, had some context in, you know, the 1789 revolution, the Napoleonic Wars, movements like Romanticism, Socialism, they have all of this context. And I find that this, this helps because we're able to take gender and sexuality topics and actually have them see that it's not just some like side narrative or digression but that it's an inextricable part of these larger political and social developments that we've been tracing so far. Um, and I'd like to begin by asking students about their observations on current discourses of gender. You know, what have they seen about, you know, discussions about gender or sexuality in the news recently? Um, and given ongoing debates about LGBTQ rights, about all these legal challenges to public, you know, bathroom use by transgender students, um, they tend to think of this idea of gender as a fluid category as a very contemporary issue. And they think, well, in the 19th century, it must have been much more categorical. And typically, the week before I introduce this topic, we'll have spent a week th th um, thinking about class consciousness, class identity so they have like separate spheres doctrine in the mind and although I'll already have started complicating that by saying well you know we have emerging venues of mixed sex sociability happening already in the early 19th century they tend to think well you know women were expected to stay in the home men were increasing in the world of business you know bourgeois mentality in the industrial age all of these are kind of the assumptions that they come in with and I find that popular imagery of the early 19th century provides a very engaging way to break down some of these assumptions. Um, and although I think that you could probably use examples from the fine arts as well, I think students are less intimidated when they see things like caricatures because they don't feel like, oh, there's one correct interpretation. They think, well, it's just, you know, it's a cartoon really is what it is. So it's able, I'm able to uh, foster discussion a bit more openly. Um, so I use two sets of images to illustrate the instability of gendered constructs. Um, um, in the 19th century. And the first set is here from Onohe Domiya's ancient history series of the 1840s, um, which includes these illustrations of Narcissus and Endymion. Um, and I'll begin by asking them what they know about these stories. And typically, students usually know more about Narcissus than Endymion, but I'll explain these stories, you know, what, what they were about, what the myth is about. And I'll also show some examples from the fine arts that showcase, you know, how these have been enduring myths in the history of art for centuries, sort of, you know, ideals about beauty and aesthetics that artists have loved to explore in, in these kinds of ways. And we'll start with this kind of comparison to think, okay, so what is Domia doing to these two favored myths of neoclassical art? Um, so we'll go back to this one. 
and they'll see, you know, they'll be able to tell just, you know, visually that, okay, yes, the other set of images, the fine art paintings, there is an aesthetic exploration happening that clearly the artists are very unironically exploring these paragons of male beauty and that there's an interest in kind of, you know, the aspects of, you know, again, art, beauty all coming together. While here, Domia is clearly mocking male pretensions to beauty at this time. And we can sort of, you know, start with that initial observation to ideally lead to the larger question of why. Why is this a critique that needs to be made at this moment if you think that, you know, understandings of gender are so categorical? Why is this something that has to enter into social discourse? So these questions and observations help set the stage for linking the seemingly peripheral topic of masculine beauty um, to larger political and social discourses. Um, for example, we'll revisit, you know, Napoleon's age, the fall of the first empire in particular, and how there was this kind of sentiment, this crisis in gender that you could no longer be a soldier or warrior in the post-Napoleonic age. We'll also revisit the movement of romanticism, that there's this cultivation of sentiment and sensibility over force and physicality, and that there are all these kind of ambiguous gendered expressions that are emerging as a result in literature and the arts. Um, and I might even bring in the strain of romantic socialism, whose actors were you know, drawing on the figure of the androgyne as being the ideal manifestation of social unity in this very fractured era. So by examining some of the factors that allowed a more ambiguous masculinity to flourish in post-revolutionary society and culture, students are able to start understanding the instability of gendered norms in this era and the critique of some of those expressions um, as part of these larger processes of social reform and change. Uh, the second set of images that I like to bring in are from Edouard de Beaumont's Le Vesuvian series from 1848, um, which challenges traditional depictions of 19th century femininity, as you can see here. Um, to give you a bit of background for those not familiar with this particular image set, the Vesuvian were this, they were a somewhat mythical, radical feminist group that may or may not have formed in March of 1848 when the February Revolution revived hopes about women's rights. Um, and I say they may or may not have formed because their existence or their reality has been actually completely contested by some scholars that it was like a fabrication of the French police. Um, I don't know, the, I don't think anyone really knows the full story of it. But there are historical accounts of a group of unmarried young working class women who were active for a few months uh, between like February and November of that year, organizing street demonstrations and creating a political constitution where they demanded sexual equality in marriage and also that, you know, those voice su support for mandatory military service for women. Um, and their political existence, if real, was very brief, just a few months in 1848, but they reached the level of myth and legend through the kind of imagery that they inspired in the popular press, where they were satirized and sometimes mocked as this band of cross-dressing militants at a time when, you know, it's in fact illegal for women to wear pants in public. Um, the political significance of these images have been much deliberated by scholars, and they tend to generate very enthusiastic discussion in the classroom because students can look at it and try to see, well, what is happening, you know, thinking about 1848, early feminist movement, how can we interpret what the, what the artist is doing here, or how these images might have been received. And, you know, I, I do have to assist them along the way, but I find that even without them having read anything about, you know, art historical analyses of these images, that they're able to actually make their way through the different range of scholarly interpretations that are out there. So for example, perhaps these caricatures were trying to preserve the status quo by mocking this potentially threatening feminist movement in 1848. Or in a counter reading, which is one that um, historian Laura Strumminger has proposed, maybe this you know, art here served to inspire a new reality that there were revolutionary ideas about male-female relations, especially the image on the right, that were being introduced um, before the fact, and that this, these images actually provided a forum for working through feminist ideas for people of the time. Um, and usually, you know, someone will point out that, well, these figures are incredibly sexy. They're young, they're attractive, they're seductive, you know, they're, they're athletic. Um, and what is most striking is that, yes, they are cross-dressed, they are wearing, you know, men's clothing, but that outfit actually highlights the female, for, uh, female form in 
more visible ways than a dress might have done. And that perhaps by replacing this eroticized female body under the control of the male gaze, these prints might be eliding the larger social issues underlying their creation, and in a sense diffuse the political charge at a very charged moment. Um, so these are just the two examples that I wanted to share that I do that I use in the sort of midpoint of the semester and I find that through a discussion of these images students are able to start probing the complexities and instabilities of gender in the 19th century and start relating those discourses to the broader political and social moment here 1848 early feminism you know class activism and such um, and I find that the exercise of having the students interpret the images themselves without actually having read any scholarly um, analyses and helping them, having them witness the diversity of analyses that sort of stem from the classmates themselves, that it helps them understand the work of historians as this open-ended process that they can participate in. Um, so I will close there. Thank you.